So we, we all grew up with a system that says that if you're not good at mathematics at a young age, you won't be able to succeed in technology and science. And that's just not true now. The Industrial Sage Executive Series, sharing the stories behind game-changing executives, their organizations, and insights into today's industry challenges. Hey, thank you for joining me today on today's Industrial Sage Executive Series interview. I have the CEO of Nanotronics, Matthew Putman. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining me today uh, from, uh, from New York. Oh, man, it's great to be here. Thank you. So for those who aren't familiar with Nanotronics, tell me a little bit about you know, your organization and what you guys do. Sure. Um, Nanotronics is a science and technology company. Uh, we blend artificial intelligence. We actually make robotics. We make microscopes. We bring these together in order to scale technologies that are either cha a challenge to scale otherwise or need to get to the next level. Uh, so whether they're large businesses who need to innovate, mm -hmm. uh, which we all need to continue to do, yeah. or they're upcoming businesses such as quantum computing, nanotechnology, genomics, a number of really interesting businesses. And what, what I'm interested in, maybe we can talk about some, I'm interested that technology as foundational technology that has to do with process control, how things are made, has not really changed since the 1950s. And I think that would surprise people. But now with some of these new technologies that I mentioned, it's possible to make change. Absolutely. Well, it's a, it's a very exciting time in the industry and across multiple industries and verticals as we go through a lot of this digital transformation. There's a huge emergence of technology that's, that, you know, that is happening. You're seeing it really just revolutionize many, many, many businesses. Uh, and you're going to continue to see that as it, like that technology growth curve continues to just kind of grow you know, exponentially. But before we get into all of that really fun and exciting stuff, um, you know, I want to know your backstory. How you know? Tell me. Um, t you know? How did you start your career? How did you get into manufacturing? Look, my career goes back um, farther than most people. Uh, when I was a child, my uh, my father had started a business, mm. uh, and actually both of my parents. Um, and before that, my grandparents worked in a in a sort of startup. So they so I come in from this sort of serial entrepreneur background, but in making factory equipment. Hmm. So back when I was eight years old, my father started a business that put, um, you know, computers, personal computers at the beginning of the commercial, personal computer age in 1982 onto factory floors for doing process control. And you'll hear a lot of why, how that has directed my life. So I grew up in that type of uh, environment in a factory hmm. itself, um, uh, you know, seeing businesses grow. Uh, and, you know, I went through other times in my life then. I, I'm a musician. I play free jazz piano oh. and I, started, I produced plays and movies and try you know, really explored, you know, where arts and this background that I would had in industry, you know, how was this different? How were we all part of the same world? Um, I ended up getting a PhD in applied physics, working for my family business and continuing to play music. I was working at a university. Uh, I had had a really wonderful lab at this university. And we would see these great inventions coming out of the lab. The problem is they weren't actually coming out of the lab. They were staying within the lab. Mm. So we were working with things like nano antennae in order to be able to make foldable tanks that worked at night. We were working with regenerative medicine scaffolds mm. that would extend life. But we couldn't celebrate too much because it was hard to get these things off the ground. I grew up in this business where I was dealing with scale of industries that were lower profit type businesses. Mm -hmm. and then I was dealing with no scale at all. So on most some of the most exciting science and technology in the world. So nanotronics was an effort to take the most interesting things and scale them for a wider audience. So I went through this strange path to get where I am. Uh, that's ex okay. So let me back up a little bit. So a uh, lot, a lot going on here. You mentioned, I think I heard you said that you even obviously you know musician, do a new jazz piano. I think that's awesome. But also you were uh, you produced some plays and some movies. Did I hear that right? 
Yeah, and I, I'm still really involved in the arts. I mean, I think it, I think it makes a fuller um, experience of what's going on in the world and what's going on internally. So I'm on a board of two nonprofits, one that's an art and science um, nonprofit. The other is a dance and theater nonprofit um, and, and still involved with producing movies and plays from time to time. Certainly, it's not a job anymore. It's, a, uh, it's something that I care deeply about, though, still, yeah. That's, that, that's really exciting. So, all right. Um, so, obviously, you've, you've got, this was something, that entrepreneurial spirit, that gene, if you will, that, I mean, you, 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 you grew up in that, obviously. You mentioned, you know, fa- generationally. I mean, it, it was a thing. Um, was there a moment... And when, you know, you mentioned you were eight years old and, you know, you were, you know, seeing how, you know, putting PCs and, and you know, into a, you know, into a plant and, and utilizing that. What, was there like a, a, a moment that stands out that where you this is awesome. I love this and I want to do this for the rest of my life. So there were a lot of wonderful moments as a kid and as a teenager. But I think that it was as an adult, after, you know, while working in the arts, while you know, I had two really great mentors. In addition to my life has been this sort of journey of gaining new mentors. And I hope that I find more as we go on. But outside of my family, um, I had this music teacher in high school, um, uh, Eleanor Meineke, and she became a dear friend of mine, introduced me to the opera and to art in ways that I hadn't experienced before. And her husband, was a material scientist and applied physicist that worked at a university. So I used to spend all of these dinners going to operas then and talking. And I realized that these two people were, you know, were what my life was going to be, what the things that would bring me both fulfillment and where I could have some influence in the world. So it's hard to remember exactly one moment, but the the time that I remember the most was then I never considered myself a scientist and capable. And this mentor, Eberhard Meineke, Ellender's husband, um, I did this presentation for, uh, about, and I was so nervous, I wanted his help. And he said, this is really good work, you should take it forward. And I, I remember this gave me an enormous amount of confidence that I could participate. I mean, I'm nothing special, but I could participate in creating something. That's awesome. Um, so, you know, I love this theme that we're kind of talking about here a little bit about the, the blend of really art, art and industry, or the, I think you mentioned early on that some of the challenges when you were um, you know, going through a PhD was there was a lot of R&D development, a lot of innovation that was happening inside the labs, but yet from, from a, it wasn't going to market, if I understand that correctly, you know, it was, or, or implementing scale to it. And Sounds like you found a way to bring both of those worlds together now, to be able to, to do that, to have a playground, if you will, to come up with these innovations, these solutions to these real world challenges, but then actually to be able to go to market and, and, and scale them. Oh yeah, and we're incredibly lucky because we make something physical, but more than that, our customers do. Mm-hmm. And so we, we do have not only a sandbox for our you know, our, our incredible R&D engineers and, you know, and the people who build the things and, and do the engineering and the drawings. But we get to see, we get to sort of step back and see what's going on in the world and where it, where it could be in the next two, five and 10 years. And I, I, I consider these technologies that we get to see and what we participate in as foundational technologies. Which is different than where we've lived in maybe the last 15 or 20 years, which I would call applications. You know, you have apps on the iPhone, but what is going on inside an iPhone? What are the huge amount of chipsets that are inside there? How are they improving? Is there something that is stagnant about the way things are made, even while the world of applications was getting better and better? And, you know, I'm feeling if, if those foundational things are not improved, at the rate of the applications, you won't have the next generation of applications either. That's making factories artificially intelligent, not just apps and advertising tech that are, that are um, using artificial intelligence as, a, as an example. 
That's no, that's um, no. You're 100 percent right. You're talking about the, the, uh, changing and in, in innovating the platform. That you, that 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 foundational piece, something that you were able to build build upon there. So, um, I got a couple questions. I want to figure out which one I'm going to ask first. But uh, you know, I think I know the answer to this. But what what's the thing that like you get up every morning and you you said this is what I want to go tag. This is my motivation. This is my purpose. What is that? You know, if you know the answer, tell me. That would. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, you know, every day, if every day were the same thing that I wanted to tackle, um, get into, you know, I, I'm, I get bored too easily to get in a kind of routine like that. I'm lucky to see new challenges all the time. But those, those things are, they fall broadly on the category of bringing a level of abundance that doesn't exist now. And that could be getting rid of waste. So that's waste of humans wasting their time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can be a waste of capital. It could be actually creating a sustainable environment. And so the way we look at it is that if you build things more efficiently and you have the speed to iterate and create new things faster, you also eliminate waste. So we do this in a number of ways and our customers do. We want to, our customers work on things like you know, making next generation semiconductors so that we do have better smartphones, or they work on making full genome sequencing much faster and less expensive. And from that, you get a certain abundance because it will eventually lead to personalized medicine. So we get to see a lot of these incredibly exciting things happen. And that's what gets me up in the morning <laughs> to come to work. And what, what an incredible thing to get to work with our team to help enable those things to occur. That's awesome. Now, it, it, hey, it sounds like you have a really fun, uh, you, you got a fun company, fun job there. Um, I mean, that I, you know, and I have a, a very unique um, um, admiration for you because uh, I do not have a, like, like sort of that engineering bone or that, that I, I, I can't do that. So, um, so kudos, kudos to you, that's awesome. I don't know that I have any home for engineering. I think, first of all, I think that there's something that people have lost track of is that they think that we are at an age where things have become so complex mm. that we can no longer invent. I mean, there was a time 150 years ago, 120 years ago, where most patents were done by individuals. Mm. Um, now it's very large corporations that hold most of the patent portfolio of our country. Um, and, and this can lead to the feeling that you're not an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I bet you have ideas every day and can build. So a, a big part of it is just inspiring people. Not that I'm particularly good at that, but there is something that needs to be done through, usually through showing people that it is possible that they can, that they can be building the way that a different generation did. But now with these tools of things like artificial intelligence, uh, to be able to build. Well, you've got me sold. You're inspiring me on that. You know, and I think that um, one of the, you know, maybe uh, when we talk about some of the challenges in the industry, one of them is um, is a workforce, actually attracting, you know, a new workforce into the, into the industry. And I think what you mentioned right there was talking about inspiring people and showing people like what what can be done? You know, we, we were just we were at um, Modex a couple of weeks ago, um, you know, big material handling and supply chain trade show, um, and it was it's amazing to see all the the robotics and the innovation and the AI and the and the um, you know uh, virtual reality and the um, just all the things you know all the innovation going on and, and I think there's a there's a, a lot of times that people particularly the younger generations like oh that space is just kind of like you know manufacturing and uh, logistics uh. but you said something really key I think you, you know and, and and that 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 we, maybe it's a lot closer than we think you know I mean you know it's 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 everything that exists inside of what we're doing, but it's actually something that is accessible. I mean, it's something I used to say back when a lot of people are talking about Facebook being invented in a dorm room. I used to say, I don't want the next social network to be made in a dorm room. I want the next factory. Yeah. And we see where people can get inspired to do such a thing. You can see where 3D printing is going. Mm -hmm. What if 
a 3D printer you can think of as a small robot and a small factory. Yeah. What if the human is enabled to, you know, dream up the thing that they want to invent? And this piece of automate, this tool that's automated can then take that human potential and that human creativity and build it for them. So one thing nanotronics is doing is taking then a 3D printer and you know and other things that are that can help people build and freeing the human to do the creative work and using an AI to make this as good as possible, to make something more than just toys, to make something that is foundational and interesting and is going to bring about a new type of industrial revolution. And suddenly, if you think in this world of, you know, what can I print because I dreamed it, then suddenly you you are empowered to dream it and to create it. Absolutely. So, well, okay. So on that note, one of the things I would love to ask, this, is my, this might be a little off script, but we hear about this all the time. Um, we hear about, you know, virtual reality, AI, machine learning, all these great applications in the manufacturing space. What are some concrete ways, and I think you kind of started to get into that a little bit, what are some concrete ways that manufacturers are rolling out with, you know, AI-enabled, you know, robotics, or you know, what, like, what are, some, what are some specific uses? So, I, I, want to not be negative with what I'm going to say, but often when you think what you think is happening in the world, it may not be. So a robot itself in a factory is not the most exciting thing about a factory. Right. Yeah. The way that it's working right now. Um, so it's, it's almost what is about to happen that we should be getting excited about more than what currently is happening. And what is about to happen is the things that we have seen in artificial intelligence that have excited us in other fields are going to make their way into how we build things. So I'm, are you familiar with um, uh, you know, a, a division of Alphabet called DeepMind was able to beat the, the greatest Go player in the world, something called AlphaGo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and this was a huge moment for or really for the world to see that the most complex game where there's more potential ways of, of moves than all the atoms in the universe. And a AI using something called deep reinforcement learning could be optimized in order to take moves that were not intuitive to humans at all mm -hmm. and be better than any human. This, was, th this wasn't just a brute force approach. This was having to think and correct and follow new strategies and new tactics along the way. Now, factories don't currently work this way, but we're making factories work that way now for the first time, hmm. where it's not just robots that are building, let's say, semiconductors, or you go into a te the Tesla factory and they're making uh, cars with, with single robots that are that's incredible factories. But what if you're making something and as you make it, there, there is a problem with it, or as you make it, you could make it better. And a machine, not too dissimilarly from winning an AlphaGo, mm -hmm. makes a change in, in the process in real time to make the best product. Then it's only our imaginations that are limited to what can be built. So that factory becomes less of an assembly line, the way that you consider a sort of Henry Ford style assembly line, which is still the way most factories are, by the way, whether there's robots or not. And it becomes different variations of additive manufacturing, um, like you would think of a 3D printer. And this happens, you know, we're seeing this happen in the field of genomics. We're seeing it um, in LIDAR for, for autonomous vehicles that we're very involved with. We're seeing it for the very first quantum computers that are being built, mm -hmm. a really big deal. And we're, you know, we're, we're going to see it. And we have to see it in things that involve super complex supply chains, like a computer, like a, a, a smartphone or smart device in general, um, that, that can be built in a, in a more distributed fashion. Once we can do that, we know that we have an intelligent factory. That's, so we're really, you know, to, to, to put it in a, um, I'm going to put it in my terms here a little bit. I'm going, to, I'm going to bring it down a few notches now because as I understand, it's really the ability to be able to adapt sort of on the fly. So be able to input and take in all kinds of data and be able to process it at a ridiculous speed to be able to say, 
I've detected changes that would make this more efficient, and then now we are able to actually go implement those changes in more of a real-time fashion. Is that? Um, by making choices, by the by an AI making choices to fix things that humans would not be able to make. Mm. And you can also, we do this also with manual, where we're doing a kind of augmented reality where we track people's hands when they're making things and show them how to make corrections. Now I say we, it is the AI that's making the corrections or showing the human how, but it's the human that did the design or the human that has defined what they want to make, that thing that matters to them. So with the advent of, you know, quantum computing, I mean, just the amount of data crunching that they're able to do is just, it's like exponentially, it will exponentially increase. So you're going to be able to see more of this. I mean, didn't Google, suppose, didn't, wasn't this one of the things that they supposedly cracked uh, over the summer last year? Well, cracking is a funny thing. They did something <laughs> that was deemed this thing called quantum um, supremacy. So in a way, the way I see that is it's kind of a way of showing that quantum mechanics can work for creating something other than a classical computer. You still can't do an enormous amount with a quantum computer, but it showed that we've hit a, an inflection point that soon you will be able to do things that were, are currently impossible to do with a classical computer. So we're just at the very, very beginning of that, and it's extremely exciting. That, that sounds extreme. I, you know, I can't wait. I'm, I imagine all the change in the innovation and the the the, the the increase in the efficiencies and the, and, the, and, the, and the processes that you that you're seeing. And you mentioned, you know, with supply chain, I imagine that it's 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 really a new, it's a new era. You know, it'll be a, a new as we talked about before, a new journey. You know, as we we are, we we are, you know, you know, go through all this. I think that's going to be uh, very 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 exciting to see what unfolds and all the different solutions and and and, and increases in efficiency. Yeah, it's certainly more than increases in efficiency. It's it's actually completely foundational um, in a way that we haven't seen in, in several generations. Well, so, so kind of moving along here, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing? Uh, you know, obviously we've kind of touched on a little bit. What, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing in the industry um, right now from, from your viewpoint? So right now we're on a path um, where we think that there is commodification of everything. We have, we've had, for your, your life and mine, um, you've had something called Moore's Law, which you're familiar with. Are you familiar with Moore's Law? That um, basic idea is that you have computational power that increases at the same price, and at the same time, you know, price and cost for us um, all, um, comes down as things get faster and better. But there's also something that's happening that is a bit dangerous and a challenge is that to make those electronic devices, the factories to build them are exponentially getting more expensive. Mm. There are fabs, which are fabrication factories to build semiconductors that cost over $20 billion to make now, to build a factory. It's unthinkable for any other generation or any other time. Any other time, meaning even 10 years ago, this was unthinkable. So a huge challenge is to bring about some of the changes that I was mentioning earlier in order to make factories much, much less expensive. If you don't do that, the barrier to entry is going to be huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine the barrier entry for you to, to, to create a podcast or for us to write an app that might be interesting for our phones or for the computer, the barrier to entry is only our imagination mm -hmm. and what we want to do with it. The barrier to make a, making a factory right now can be billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge that we have to face in that, or we're going to have real stagnation. And that's what we're looking to face. I think that's by far the biggest one. Interesting. How are you, so how are you guys solving that? I think creating these closed loop AI systems that have corrective action, um, a, this is, this is a really big thing. You don't have waste of materials. You don't have incredible amounts of expensive equipment. So generally factories are built with, I'd say, a hardware solution to building things. So if you think about that Henry Ford factory line, it is a line, but in this case, it's a line of very expensive 
physical things mm -hmm. to build something like, let's say, semiconductors and those $20 billion plus fabs. Um, if you could do this at single station, at one small station the size of my desk, mm -hmm. which is something that Nanotronics works at, that we can do all types of testing and AI analysis. The reason we can do that is that we don't use a big hardware solution. We use computation. And that computation is partially AI. It's partially the ability to have um, controls that could never exist before over the machines. So it's really switching the mentality to having computers and software solve for things that used to only be done with very complex, expensive hardware. Excellent. Yeah. Um, well, I, um, you know, it sounds like, again, what you guys are doing is, 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 is very cool. I think that a lot of people, and myself included, you know, um, I, I, uh, I'm excited to learn more about it. As I, you know, I don't know a whole lot about this, and I think that it's, it's exciting to see, you know, new, new companies such as yourself coming in and doing this and, and, and to really solve a lot of these challenges um, that, we're, that we're seeing in, in, the, uh, in the industry. And, um, you know, to, to, to pivot a little bit, and I apologize, these questions are very, uh, you know, redundant or maybe a little I obtuse. Don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true at all. I think you totally get it. And I, I mean, I, no, I, and I do think you could be in Pentank, by the way. <laughs> no, I think um, I, I, this is great. And I feel like you hear these terms and this stuff being slung around all the time. But my gut, you know, uh, is that a lot of people, and even myself and Claire, are like, yeah, oh, absolutely, yes, this. But really, at the end of the day, it's like actually having a, some sort of deep understanding or knowledge of it is very little. Um, we did a big thing on um, blockchain uh, a couple weeks ago, and I said, "Listen, we're just gonna let's just I'm gonna ask the really stupid questions." And I mean, that was one of our most viewed videos. People were really interested in how, you know blockchain in manufacturing, and, and we just went very simply, like, "What is this? Is blockchain Bitcoin?" Well, no. Like, you know, these are these are the questions that people they, they ask us. Um, you know, and so it's, uh, well, I, I think when I, this, it's so important to know that these things are more graspable than society would say they are. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges is just to let people know that they're capable, more capable than the system says they are. Yeah. So we, we all grew up with a system that says that if you're not good at mathematics at a young age, you won't be able to succeed in technology and science. And that's just not true now. It's absolutely right that you're asking questions about blockchain and having an episode about it. And it makes sense that more, many people are listening to it because many people may be able to get in and utilize blockchain in their lives. And they get to understand the way that the world is working around them. That should be inspirational that we can all create something. Awesome. No, I love it. That's, um, that's awesome. So um, kind of wrapping up our segment, um, so for those who would, you know, like to learn a little bit more about Nanotronics um, or yourself, what, you know, what's the best way? I mean, obviously, go to your website, nanotronics.co, C-O, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And on our website, we have a section called Think Space. And these are podcasts that I've done. There's some, you know, and then there's some other places on our site that has some media that we've done. Those are, are more about these philosophical ideas, but they're also... Um, interviews that I've done with other people to hear you know, what other people's mentors are. And then somehow it does tie to what Nanotronics does as well. So absolutely go to the website and just you know, float around to these different areas of it and, and hopefully you find something of interest. Awesome. Well, um, Matthew, thank you so much for, for, for spending some time with us on the executive series here. I loved it. Thank you. I, I loved it as well. So um, we'll, we'll be releasing this soon. So thank you so much. Great. All right. So uh, that wraps today's uh, Industrial Sage Executive Series interview with the CEO, uh, Matthew Putman, of, the, of Nanotronics here. So really great episode. I really enjoyed learning about a lot of this stuff. A lot of really cool stuff coming down the track. So. Um, be sure to, uh, to like and subscribe, join in the conversation that we're going to have on social media. If you're not on our email list, I encourage you to subscribe. And I'll be back next week with another episode of Industrial Sage. Thanks for watching or listening. Industrial Sage is an open platform where companies can showcase their expertise and solutions to a captive audience of industrial professionals. 
Thank you for listening to this week's episode. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. Want us to tell your story? Go to industrialsage.com. This week's episode was produced by Rika Wiersma, filming by Donovan Jones, editing by Rika Wiersma, music composed by Oliver Michael, and executive producers Danny Gonzalez and David Karen. This is the Industrial Sage Executive Series.